Hi, and welcome back to my videos for General Chemistry 2. Today I want to wrap up our discussion of entropy and energy by tying it back to equilibrium, a topic we discussed for several weeks earlier in the course. One question that we never answered when we talked about equilibrium is, why are some chemical reactions irreversible, but others are reversible and can occur in both backward and forward directions? As we'll see today, the Gibbs free energy can give us an answer to that question. You might recall that when we were learning about Gibbs free energy in the last video, we saw that a reaction is spontaneous when delta G is less than zero, and non-spontaneous when delta G is greater than zero. That means that the reaction will proceed in the forward direction when delta G is a negative number. When delta G is positive, the reaction is non-spontaneous, but that doesn't mean that no reaction is possible. Instead, the reaction is spontaneous in the reverse direction. So, for example, here's a chemical reaction with a positive value for the Gibbs free energy. Because delta G is non-spontaneous, the forward reaction can't occur unless we put energy into the system. However, the reversed reaction does happen spontaneously. Also, as you might remember from the last video, when delta G for a reaction equals zero, the reaction is at equilibrium, so the forward and reverse reactions happen at the same rate. It turns out that if delta G is between positive and negative 5 kilojoules per mole, then the reaction is reversible. For example, here's the reaction in which methanol vapor becomes a liquid. If we calculate the Gibbs free energy for this reaction, we find that it's negative 4.4 kilojoules per mole. It's a negative number, which tells us that the reaction happens spontaneously. That makes sense. Methanol is a liquid at room temperature, so it makes sense that the right side of the equation is more favorable. However, notice that the Gibbs free energy is between positive and negative 5 kilojoules. That means the reaction is reversible. That also makes sense. If you've ever worked with methanol, you know that it evaporates very quickly, so there is an equilibrium between the two sides of the reaction. In other words, a significant portion of the methanol molecules will be in the gas phase, even if the liquid phase is more favored. Here's another example, in which iodic acid dissociates to form aqueous hydrogen and iodate ions. We saw this one when we talked about weak acids back in video 22. The Gibbs free energy of this reaction is positive 4.39 kilojoules per mole. Like the previous reaction, this reaction has a delta G between positive and negative 5 kilojoules, so this is a reversible reaction. But unlike the previous reaction, delta G is positive, so this reaction isn't spontaneous in the forward direction. Instead, the reaction favors the reactants, so the reaction is spontaneous in the reverse direction. On the other hand, reactions that have a Gibbs free energy greater than positive 5 kilojoules, or less than negative 5, are irreversible. For example, the combustion of methane is definitely an irreversible reaction. We never expect to see the carbon dioxide and water recombine to reform methane and oxygen. And when we calculate delta G, we find out that it's negative 800.8 kilojoules per mole. That's way outside the range that we'd get for a reversible reaction. It's a large negative number, so the reaction is irreversible in the forward direction. Here's another reaction we've seen before. Solid silver chloride dissociates to form aqueous silver and chloride ions. Delta G for this reaction is positive 55.62 kilojoules per mole. This is another irreversible reaction, but this one has a positive Gibbs free energy, so it's irreversible in the reverse direction. That makes sense for this reaction. Silver chloride is usually considered to be an insoluble compound, and this is why. Very little of the ions will exist in this system because the solid silver chloride reactant is heavily favored by the Gibbs free energy. So, as you can tell, there's a definite connection between the Gibbs free energy and equilibrium. The exact relationship between them was determined by Josiah Gibbs. He figured out that the two are related by this equation. In this equation, delta G is the Gibbs free energy. 
This quantity is called the standard Gibbs free energy. That means it's delta G measured at standard temperature and pressure. That's what we calculate using the data in Appendix C of our textbook using this equation. Next, we have R, the gas law constant. You might remember that when we studied activation energy in video 14, we saw that R is equal to 8.314 joules per Kelvin mole. T is the temperature, and Q is the reaction quotient. You might remember the reaction quotient from back in video 17, where we saw that it's the concentrations of the products over the reactants, each raised to an exponent equal to the coefficient from the balanced equation. This is the same definition as for K, the equilibrium constant, but we use the symbol Q because this equation works even if the reaction isn't at equilibrium yet. Let's see what we can do with this equation. A little earlier we saw this reaction. Suppose we perform the reaction at 100 degrees Celsius and take measurements when it's not at equilibrium yet. Instead, we find that we have concentrations of 0.100 molar iodic acid, 0.0300 molar hydrogen ion, and 0.0800 molar iodate ion. If we plug those into the formula for Q, we get a Q of 0.240. We'll plug that into our equation along with R. The temperature is 100 Celsius, which is 373.15 Kelvin. Finally, we mentioned a little earlier that delta G at standard temperature is positive 4.39 kilojoules per mole. Since our value for R contains joules in its unit, we should convert our data for delta G into joules too, so it's 4390 joules. When we perform the calculation, we get negative 7,180 joules. What does that tell us? Well, the Gibbs free energy is large and negative, so it's telling us that at this temperature, when we have these concentrations for the compounds in the reaction, the reaction spontaneously goes to the right. So, this is a very useful equation. Using it, we can determine whether or not any chemical reaction will occur at a given temperature. All we have to know is the concentrations of the compounds and the standard Gibbs free energy. Since we know the standard delta G for hundreds of different compounds, that means we can predict whether or not thousands of different reactions are possible. But there's another useful thing we can do with this equation. It turns out that if we know the standard Gibbs free energy for a reaction, we can figure out its equilibrium constant, or vice versa. Here's how. As you might recall, at equilibrium, the Gibbs free energy is equal to zero. So if the reaction is at equilibrium, we can set the left side of this equation equal to zero. Also, if we're at equilibrium, the reaction quotient Q is equal to K, the equilibrium constant for the reaction. If we move the standard delta G to the left side of the equation, we get this. As you can see, if we know delta G, we can figure out the equilibrium constant, or vice versa. Let's try it. Suppose we perform the reaction in which carbonic acid reacts to form water and CO2 at 25.0 degrees Celsius. What will be the equilibrium constant? We'll use the equation we just talked about. All we need is the standard delta G, which we can figure out using Appendix C and this equation. When we look up the values of delta G, we find that water is negative 237.13 kilojoules per mole, CO2 is negative 394.4, and carbonic acid is negative 639.7. That gives us a delta G of 8.17 kilojoules per mole. We'll plug that into our equation, along with R and the temperature, which is 298.15 Kelvin. Remember, R uses joules in its unit, not kilojoules, so we need to convert our value of delta G to joules too. Now we just solve the equation. First, I'll multiply R and the temperature. Next, I'll divide both sides by negative 2749 joules per mole. Finally, we get rid of the logarithm by making the left side the exponent on E.
That gives us a result of 0 0.0370 for k. That probably seemed like a pretty ordinary calculation, but it's actually a really impressive accomplishment. That's because we just figured out the equilibrium concentration of a reaction without having to know anything about the concentrations of any of the compounds in the reaction. We've never been able to do that before. And that's a very useful tool we now have. We can figure out the equilibrium constant for any reaction without ever having to perform a measurement in the lab, as long as we know delta G for the reaction. And this calculation can also be used in reverse. If we know the equilibrium constant, we can determine delta G for a reaction. For example, suppose we want to know more about the reaction in which benzoic acid dissociates in water at 50.0 degrees Celsius. The equilibrium constant for that reaction is 6.31 times 10 to the negative fifth power. From that, we can determine the standard delta G for the reaction. It turns out that when we perform the calculation, we get positive 25,980 joules per mole. Or, using significant figures, we find that delta G is positive 26.0 kilojoules per mole. Well, that's enough new material for now. You've learned about some powerful new tools today, and we'll be using them in class and in the homework soon. It's about time for another test, too. So before the next test, you'll want to be comfortable with the topics we discussed today. Good luck on that test, and have a good week.